I'm feeling it now. Gears of War, a flagship for Xbox and a titan of the 360 era of console gaming. Chainsawing grubs in half, emotional truckers, monsters from below, and brutal executions all in one brilliant package. Spots of nuance and depraved hope within a broken world. A series that began with its reveal in 2005 and a trailer that was strong enough to make people go out and buy an Xbox 360. A series doing a billion in revenue by 2014 and selling millions of copies in its heyday. And one name stands out among the rest of the writers, actors, and producers of these games. A name that is often attached when talking about the things Gears did right and where it failed. Cliff Blazinski. A creative spirit with big ideas and a non-stop drive to do something cool. But, as of late, if you see anyone talking about Cliff, it's more of a negative than a positive when it comes to his involvement on the series. Most people probably just know him as the guy that posed with a Lancer a whole bunch. But, what made him such a divisive figure among the fans, and why do some call for his comeback to the series as if he were a messiah? while others rant that he should never return. In order to answer that, we should go back to before Cliff even served at Epic Games, back in 1990 when a 15 to 16 year old Cliff made a first person turned point and click adventure game called The Palace of Deceit, later subtitled The Dragon's Plight, where a man of the future is brought to the past and a dragon fights against an evil wizard, all created in Microsoft Paint without sound or music. In 1992, he would attempt to get on board with Tim Sweeney at Epic before getting a chance to work on a platformer demo called Jazz Jackrabbit with Arjan Brucey. That's probably pronounced very wrong, I'm sorry. Who would go on to co-found Guerrilla Games, the makers of Killzone and later Horizon, eventually getting his wish to work on the Epic team proper with Sweeney and other big names like James Schmalz on the Unreal series, later becoming Unreal Tournament and eventually a title in the works known as Unreal Warfare in 2001, based on using mechs and class-based gameplay. And this is where Cliff's trajectory changed forever. With massive games of the time like Kill Switch and Resident Evil 4 that used a cover system and third person mechanics like what Gears would become, the title that would be Unreal Warfare transformed from another first person follow up on the Unreal series into the Gears of War games we now know today. With rising popularity in single player story games, the studio decided to make this its own thing and let the Unreal tournament continue to evolve in the original direction of that series. Influences from horror also bled into the game with titles like Resident Evil and popular series at the time like Band of Brothers shaping into the origins of Gears. The name itself actually taken from Metal Gear, another massive and story-based game of the time. Eventually, an early build of Gears of War 1 would be shown at the 2005 GDC conference to show off the power, fidelity, and realism that could be accomplished on the Xbox 360, making it possible for Tim Sweeney to ask Xbox to upgrade the 360's internal memory from 256 megabytes to 512 megabytes, a move that cost Xbox tens of millions of dollars and restricted its access on the market at launch, but ensured that a series like Gears would run at 720p on the 360 all the way back in 2006, something that put it ahead of the competition. What do you think? Oh, I think it could be Alpha, or it could be the Locust setting a trap. There's only one way to know for sure. Our next target is House of Sovereigns. Straight ahead, move! With the first game's release and success in November of 2006, hundreds of thousands of people brought in by the trailer alone, Gears was immediately set with and was promoted as such to be heading into a trilogy of games. Now, as you work on it, sure. what is your favorite part of this game? The favorite, my favorite yeah. part? Yeah, that's uh, gotta be like the baby, the, you know, the, I just nailed that, well, this the, is gonna be fantastic. The, the, the cover gameplay, like in this game, like if you're standing out in the middle of the open, if you're trying to circle strafe a guy, you're gonna get killed. Right. You walk into a room and you look and you're like, okay, you know, there's a fallen log, you know, there's a, a statue that I can get behind, I need to get behind that. 
And uh, you can actually blind fire, by the way, which uh, it, it was done in like, a couple other games before, right. but we're going to do it far cooler because you have this great shotgun, which is kind of this retro Winchester style. And you just kind of poke it around the corner and you fire the gun. And if you did that in real life, it would break your arm. Right. <laughs> right. But, it's, but it's cool. It's like shooting a gun gangster style. That's no one really actually games. does that, right? But it's cool. So Even I'm going so far as getting Mark Ryan, Epic Games VP of the time, to say that Gears could easily overtake Halo in popularity. I think Gears of Wars had a profound effect on the company. We just learned that the things we've been doing all along, taking our time, getting it right, really working on making something that we love to play, taking lots of chances and, and experimenting. We did a lot of prototyping, right? And we just learned that, that that we were always on the right course. We just needed to take it up in the scale a little bit. For reference, this was only two years after the massive success of Halo 2, which Gears had overtaken and was standing strong in front of, until of course Halo 3 brought it back. Cliff served as the lead designer on Gears 1, 2, and 3, and well, that other one. Game after game, doing numbers for Xbox and Epic respectively, Gears of War 2 outselling the first and Gears 3 selling 2 million copies on launch, building on the framework and adding more right from the beginning. Gears of War 2 was a big change on the first, even though it doesn't look like it on the surface. Textures are more well defined, the music and sound design are elevated to a new level never reached in the first. Guns had been rebalanced with a massive influx of new weapons and enemies that have remained as staples in the series for over a decade now. Gears 3, although much more perfect in its execution of gameplay, story, music, and upping the graphics of the second even further, gathered a lot of bad will from fans. While some new features like Horde 2.0 and Beast are still beloved to this day, others like the Sawed Off and Team Deathmatch were met with intense bile from the hardcore audience of the game something that would only get worse with time. Then came Gears of War Judgment, which didn't take one or two bold steps, but started running instead. The campaign was new and inventive, but also failed on a lot of character and narrative levels, outright hurting the canon of the series. Multiplayer was firstly broken, still is, but secondly altered in a great many ways, with the Locust removed entirely in exchange for red versus blue human teams, a new free-for-all mode and overrun, which, to be fair, did come out of the smoke as a diamond in the rough, even if a little unbalanced. New changes to gameplay like swapping the loadout system to be more casual in the eyes of the fanbase turned a lot of people off. Where Gears 3 sold 2 million copies out the gate, Judgment had only sold 1 million in a slow 6 months after release, and all but failed from a financial standpoint. Something about Judgment that a lot of people say, including myself, is that Cliff's growing control of the series led to Judgment shifting in tone and molding into what we know it is now, and what Gears might have been if it continued onward. But as I've scrolled through interviews and old videos, it seems that changes to the gameplay were originally pitched to Cliff by another member of the team. Yep. Like, uh, why did you guys decide to, you know, take off a lot of the weapon switching and the, the grenades off of the I didn't want to do it initially. Uh, Quinn Del Hoyo, who's one of our multiplayer designers floating around here, he was the one who proposed some of those changes. And we were like, no, you can't change gears. That's scary. And he's like, let me try it and, like, let's put it in the play test. And we played it and we're like, ooh, this feels good. Like, suddenly when I'm playing the campaign, and I don't want to have to swap the grenades. I can just blind throw one over and I wind up getting, like, I learn the arc and I get really good at just tossing the grenades between a whole bunch of enemies. Some quick weapon swapping also is great. You know, you can just tap the Y button, you don't have to deal with the clunky D-pad anymore for that. It, it's actually a very, very good fit for the pace of this game. But to say that Cliff had no order over the games is a bit sparse. I will agree that figures like Cliff and Rod Ferguson get a lot more hate over the things Gears has done wrong, more so than the good, because they're the faces we associate with a larger dev team that works on these games. But we're still talking about the guy who wanted to remove the Nasher from Gears of War 3. The one gun of the series that has remained a fan favorite and is almost more synonymous with Gears than the Lancer is. Not a doubt in my mind that the changes in judgment that felt antithetical to what Gears is are just as much on Cliff's plate as anyone else. I get it. You want to hype up the guy who made the first three games, but you can't just ignore this either. Plus, 
he unfortunately gave us the Berserker reproduction theory. Oh my god. After Gears of War, Cliff had left Epic in 2012, apparently wanting to retire from gaming altogether after feeling jaded and seeing other devs feeling just as burnt out in the space. In 2014, however, he came back to gaming with the reveal that he and Brucey would be founding a new studio called Boss Key. Here at Boss Key, you have nothing but the most high-tech experience here with production. You look at our high-tech, futuristic whiteboard. This is like some next-level Windows Excel organization type stuff. That's how we roll here. Working on a free-to-play arena shooter revealed a year later as Lawbreakers, eventually transforming into a paid Overwatch-esque hero shooter with selective classes. Lawbreakers launched to PlayStation and PC in 2017, and by 2018, it had done so poorly it was shut down shortly after the closure of Boss Key in the same year. And like every other studio in 2018, their game in development, known as Radical Heights, was a Battle Royale-style game that failed to leave the early access stage before Boss Key's closing. Kind of ironic that the star of Epic's second largest franchise came to right off the heels of Fortnite's gigantic splash in gaming, but I won't hold it against him, because literally every single developer had tried this to some good and many not so good extents. After Boss Key, Cliff retired from gaming once again, focusing more on writing and creative projects outside of the industry, often batting away people that either associated him with Lawbreakers or Gears exclusively, seemingly wanting to move on from video games entirely. We're gonna come back to this. He got to co-produce Hades Town and work on other smaller projects before writing a book published by Simon & Schluster called Control Freak, detailing his time and experience making video games and working in the industry, as well as a small comic called Scrapper coming later this year in July. And while Cliff has removed himself from the gaming industry, he seems not to be done with it yet. As Gears has come to a lull, he went from calling Gears 5 woke trash, to now, whenever I see an article about Gears of War, it's normally about Cliff inserting himself into some sort of future for the series where he comes back advises or makes the Netflix movie The Gears War film to make all the fans happy again. To get a little critical again, it's hard to see a guy that seemed like he'd left it all behind, but only after his own thing fails and Gears slows down, that now he wants to be an advisor and approach on the Netflix adaptation. I unironically feel like I could compare him to Andrzej Sapowski, who if you didn't know, is the author of The Witcher series who sold the game rights to CD Projekt Red because he thought he'd make a quick buck on something that would go nowhere. But once The Witcher 3 became a critical and international success, all of a sudden he felt as if he'd been wronged and wanted to get compensated for it, before also going all in on a Netflix adaptation that kind of spat in the face of the original source, but he did not seem to care in full spite of the money he'd missed out on. Or more recently with David Jaff, who like Cliff, was instrumental in the original God of War series, but eventually left and started his own thing that failed miserably and only comes out of the woodwork to claim that the new Kratos is a weak and pointless character. But don't take the character Kratos or Indiana Jones and go, you know what? I'm Steven Spielberg, I'm, I'm older now, and I'm really into family, and I want to tell stories about fathers and sons and God... No, fuck you! An argument that is even worse than Cliff's, because at least Gears 5 is kind of a bad game. My personal read of Cliff is as a guy who may have had greatness, but it slipped and he kind of clings on to it. A little bit like George Lucas, whose whole work on the Star Wars movies was a bit all over the place. See, with the original Star Wars trilogy, Lucas had people around him writers and other directors who could take George's powerful, creative ideas and do something with them. People who could look at George and go, no, that's a stupid idea, let's not do that. And it was like that until the prequels came around when Lucas had ultimate creative control. No one to get in the way and everyone to say, yes, George, do what you're doing. That's how we get performances that are less lively than a cardboard cutout. CGI that looks worse than the practical toys from the original movies and a script that says they fight for 15 pages. There's a lot of cheating in there. A lot of they fight. I think the same thing might have happened with Cliff. With Gears 1 through 3, it was not him alone working on it. Writers like Joshua Ortega and Karen Travis kept the series grounded and helped to round it out. And more smart, I've got to discover the characters. 
if they are pre-existing pre characters, then I, I, I want to flesh them out more, I want to fine tune them, I want to know where they came, I want to do all that. If I've got to create original characters, then it's the same way I look at the environment and go, who would be in that environment? Others working on PvE and PvP aspects of the game boosted more of the free-flow feeling of Gears 3 that carried on to Gears 4 and 5, something that Cliff wasn't fond of if you've ever heard him talk about the games. I do think he contributed a lot to the feel of the game, the atmosphere and the style of gameplay that is still unique today. There's other cover-based shooters out there, like Spec Ops The Line or Mass Effect, but they don't hit nearly as hard as Gears does. But when Cliff gets the keys to the castle, we see judgment. And when he's out on his own after leaving Rod, Sweeney, and the others behind, we got lawbreakers. That doesn't scream genius who can do no wrong to me, it feels like lightning in a bottle. And unfortunately, it was only a matter of time before the bottle shattered. The more you learn about Cliff's introduction to the series, from how he would pose in photo shoots, to him basing that one photo of Dom and Maria on his ex, to him going full edgelord, talking about how he did non-stop push-ups while listening to Lose Yourself the night before pitching gears to Microsoft, his additions to the lore, including the berserker thing from before, Marcus being this stoic badass that feels like a self-insert of a shy gamer teen that wanted to be the cool kid, a character with no development, no urgency in the story, outside of being the main character until Karen took over on Gears 3. Can you tell us a little bit about the story about the main character? Maybe? Yeah, the main character is this guy named Marcus Phoenix, mm -hmm. and he basically just got out of military prison for disobeying orders. And so he's. Like Tina. Exactly. <laughs> you know, Tina, Tina was in the hole for six years, and it's not going well. Humanity's on the brink of extinction, and you're, you're put in this war that you really don't want to be fight, fighting with all of your buddies, and you have to push back and essentially save everybody. That's always the case, isn't it? His nickname, which I've very purposely not been using until this point, Cliffy B, even that coming from a quote unquote, some junk kids something that he retook in his own way before saying that the moniker was just not grown up enough for him after Gears of War 2. After he started becoming popular and known by this name after Gears of War 1 and 2's massive success. On top of his activity on Twitter that kind of screams, I'm here, you aren't. Calling people who've criticized his work on Lawbreakers trolls that can't give it up after five years when he himself goes out of the way to try and tease some sort of Lawbreakers comeback. A lot of people, including myself, don't really like Cliff. I don't think he's Gears of War's saving grace, or him coming back would revive the series. I think he'll ride the coattails, and maybe if he came back the atmosphere might feel like itself again. But I don't think Cliff is the sole reason that Gears was big to begin with. I don't hate the guy but definitely dislike his attitude and self-absorption more than I like what he's added to Gears of War. But who am I? Another face in the crowd of millions who's enjoyed these games for better or for worse for years now. That's just about it. Tell me what you think of Cliff. If you want him back for Gears of War, if you agree with him that Ryan Reynolds should play Baird in the movie, I don't. Please leave a like and subscribe. And if you've liked what you've seen, become a member to get even more. Stay cool, have fun, and be awesome. Buster out.